You have stepped upon the precipice of doom, peer over the edge, and you are staring into the pits of Angband. But don't worry, I will be your guide. I know these steps like the back of my hand. This is the newest version, version 4.2.3, and has a lot of changes from previous versions, so much so that a lot of people feel like it's a different game, or like a variant. Well, I just killed off another Hobbit Ranger, and I'm going to start up another one. I'm going to change a few things about it, but more or less I'm going to keep everything the same. Press the equal key while you're on the character creation screen in order to change the birth options. We won't do advanced settings. I was playing with some advanced settings. We will keep start with the kit of useful gear off because it's actually better to start without that stuff because you can actually get a better start set up than what they recommend. So we're going to stick with our Hobbit. I'm going to do Ranger again because I like landing a good launcher and I like that doubles and shots which are fired from a sling are now indestructible. We will not be firing them in the beginning, we will be throwing them. You can see I have really high numbers for shoot and throw, which is why I like the Hobbit Ranger combination. Hobbit also has a lot of stealth which is really good. Now we're going to do point based to distribute our stats. Generally dexterity is good to have, but last game I didn't have enough hit points so I'm going to put that to 6. And also being able to cast spells from the second book is really important, so I'm going to put this to six as well. Wisdom determines how many mana points you have, how good you are at casting spells. And we will have a look at some of the spells that we can cast in just a moment. We will keep the silly name of Mendirth, and we will keep the character history. Yes. Now we will enter the town that sits above the pits of Angband. I like to check all the stores first. Before I make any purchases, although I pretty much have an idea of what I'm going to buy. There is a short bow, but we're not going to buy it. One of the changes to this game, to the new version, is that you now can throw items much more successfully than you could in the past. Daggers and spears do a lot more damage than they did before, especially spears. Some armor, we're not going to buy any armor. So there's nothing really that we're going to buy. We can start with a book. Um, so what I do is I buy one book. We're going to buy lesser charms. It's only 25 gold. These are our basic spells. They're all utility spells. None of them do anything to help us shoot better. But they do things to help us survive. That's kind of good and it's kind of it's like okay. I mean it would be more fun to help me shoot and stuff. Anyway we're going to get 23 shots. Iron shots. This is going to be our bread and butter. We're killing things in the dungeon and gaining experience and leveling up. We're also going to buy flasks of oil because they do more damage but they're one time use. And then we're going to buy four of these one of these and the rest of these now word of recall returns you from the dungeon back to town just makes us even return to town without having to go all the way up 50 stairs or whatever which would be silly or would be very tedious and then cure light wounds are really good because they replenish lost hit points and they also cure blindness and um, sometimes they cure confusion if not then they just lessen it Confusion prevents you from doing anything meaningful, like reading scrolls, walking in a straight line, and killing things. We'll spend our last piece of gold on a arrow, I guess. What else to spend it on? And that is our very bare bones setup for the dungeon. This is how I like to start, and I'll explain why as we play. And we're just going to start exploring. One of the nice things about the early game. Oops, let's just, uh, I want this centered continuously. Press the equal key when in game to bring up the options menu. One of the nice things about the early game is a lot of the rooms are lit. So it's nice and easy to see what's going on. Now, instead of punching him, we didn't buy a weapon. So normally melee is the kind of principal way that most characters in this game will kill things or attack things but mages will use spells like magic missile and rangers will shoot from a bow we don't have a bow yet we don't have enough money for that we're gonna throw shots now you may be wondering why didn't we buy that short bow and the reason is arrows break they have a 35 percent chance of breaking every time we fire them and in this new version of Bang band Throwing shots does nearly as much damage as shooting arrows, if not the same amount. So this does 5 damage every time on average when I throw it. And that's plenty, so it makes sense to do that. 
And they don't break. Shots do not break. So I can just throw them and throw them and throw them and they don't break. So that's pretty great. Eat that apple. This is how well fed I am. If it goes to zero, I die. So it's good to have food. Take the stairs that we found. Hmm, gold. Gold is good. We can go back to town and buy things later. Now, here's a soldier. A soldier is a dangerous adversary for us. He has 23 health. So if we're throwing shots and averaging five, we can expect to kill him in about five shots. And he has an armor rating of 24, which means that he's going to make it harder for us to hit than if he had zero. So we have a 70% chance to hit him. But I think this means melee. It doesn't mean throwing or shooting. So we probably have a higher chance of hitting him with our shots. But now here's the attack damage. He has one dice, seven sides. So every time he attacks, he rolls a single die and it has seven sides on it and he can do anywhere between one and seven damage. And because he does that a couple times per turn, he averages eight damage on each of his turns. That's a lot higher than some of the creatures we've killed so far. So we have to be careful when we fight him, otherwise he will kill us pretty easily. So we're gonna get some distance from him before we attack him and actually we're gonna attack this cup purse first he actually does we'll see he also he has a good attack dice too but he doesn't do that every time half the time he's trying to steal gold so his average damage is only three it's a lot less he also has a little bit less armor so he's easier to hit and what is his hit points he has less high health at 20 but only a little bit less so he'll be an easier target for us to kill whoops i'm going to load my preference file that has a bunch of preferences to make playing the game a little bit more streamlined he stole money from us before we were able to kill him and then he disappeared in a puff of smoke because that's what he does all right and he did some harm to us we might want to rest up to replenish our hit points the only problem with that is he might wake up while we're standing here and resting up so we could walk away and replenish hit points or we could take our chances and hope that we can kill him before he reaches us we could also use a flask of oil which will do more damage and we can do that if it doesn't look like it's going very well with our throwing shots so let's try shots that was a good hit he lost a third of his health so we'll try that again we missed that time. That was another hit, so now he's at half health. He hasn't gotten very far, so that's good. Oh, he ran off. He was hurt enough that he felt frightened and he ran off. Okay. Now we sit. Now we can just stand here and wait. Now we can press the five key and that will let us rest. But if we are impatient and we want him to come back sooner, we can press the capital R key. So this will allow you to put a number of turns to rest. I'm just gonna hit enter. Ampersand means rest as much as needed, basically until something happens. Either I replenish all my health or he returns and he returned first. So we will throw more shots at him. Now he's getting closer, but we missed. So it would have been a little dicey if we had missed again, but we didn't, so we don't have to worry too much about it. Now killing him gave us experience points. I forgot to tell you what those were. They were enough to level us up to level two. And now we have more maximum hit points, which is great. It'll allow us to be more adventurous and go deeper in the dungeon. It also affects other things like our ability to hit things increases slightly and our ability to shoot and throw increases slightly, among a slew of other things. So lots of good reasons to level up. It also increases our mana pool, but our mana pool, we don't even have any yet because we have low amount of wisdom. We actually have a fair amount of wisdom, but not high enough to get any mana yet. But eventually we're gonna start getting mana points displayed below our hit points. Why didn't I run after him when he ran away? If I run after him and he's running away and I'm trying to catch up to him, at some point he's gonna decide that he wants to return to the fight. And because I'm wielding a torch, I only have intensity two light, which really means I only see one square in front of me. So what would happen is he would return, and I would run into him and then he would start pummeling me. And that's because Angband is a turn-based game. There's a basically a 50% chance that would happen. The other possibility is that we would meet each other at the same time and it would be my turn to pummel him. 
but I don't want to be standing next to him when I fight him, so I don't want to chase after him. Okay, so I'm going to back up just to be extra safe. Now I know where he is. I know that he's somewhere here. And even though I don't see him, I can still throw shots where he is. And you can listen to, to, to see whether or not he's been hit. And I could hear a thwunk and that he was hit. I will chase after him because I know he's not a very dangerous monster. And he also, I think he flees a lot because he's a bat and he might flee quite far. Oh, well, I don't know where he, where he went. It would be nice if I had a spell for detection. Okay, so I stepped one more closer than I needed. He already regenerated all his health. The reason he regenerated all his health is because he has so little health to begin with, it doesn't take long for him to regenerate his meager four hit points. <laughs> so we're just going to stand here and throw it at him. And we'll kill him in one shot. Whoa. There's a lot of people here and a uh, yeek. I'm not going to go over all of the different creatures in the game because, because there are so many, but oh, look at this one. He only has a life rating of 7 and only an armor rating of 16, so I have a better chance of hitting him at 80%. But he only gives me 4 points towards leveling up. He also drops a single object or treasure. He resists bright light and acid and does not resist lightning, fire, cold, or poison. He's fairly observant of intruders, which you may notice from 180 feet. It can attack with one dice, five sides. 95% chance of hitting me because I have no armor. And he averages three damage on each of his turns. So a lot less than the warrior. Or the soldier, rather. The soldiers are the ones we're a little bit worried about. And then there's also these apprentices. 15 health, 9 AC. They don't resist any of the four or five main elemental attacks of the game. and they, But they can blind and confuse and they can produce magic missiles by casting spells. And they can do all the way up to 12 damage. So that's kind of scary. Fortunately, they don't do those things very often. One diamond 12. They can also blind me, confuse me, or blink self, which means they can teleport a short distance away. They can also hit with one dice four sides, averaging two damage on each of his turns. So as long as he's not casting his spells, he will not be doing too much damage. The Yeek has woken up first and is coming at us, so we are going to throw our shots at him. He missed three times in a row, and he has taken two of our hit points. Oh, now he hit him and he's almost dead. And before I pick up those shots, I see that this one has started to move. And now I'm going to throw my shots at him. He's frightened. I don't know where he's running, but he's going to be running away. You can see he's frightened because his hit points turn purple. He can still cast spells and do actions towards me when he's frightened. But I think he has less chance of doing any doing harm. Though I have died from monsters that were frightened. <laughs> I'll pick up these. I will not pick up the other ones because I do not want to get so close to these guys. I just want to fight them one, one at a time. And we gained another level. And not only that, we can study our magic book. And we now have mana points on the board. Two mana points total we can get. So we're going to press capital G. And then we're going to choose our lesser charms book because it's the only one we have. And we are going to learn the spell Remove Hunger. You have learned the verse of Remove Hunger. Now let's look and see what that does. We hit the Browse button and then we select Remove Hunger by hitting A. And then we have to press the question mark key to find out what it does. Magically renders you comfortably fed, but not satiated. Meaning you're not full. You could eat more if you wanted, but you're not hungry. So we will cast it. Whenever you cast new spells for the first time, you gain experience. So as soon as we can cast it, we will. Although we're 84% fed, we don't need to feed ourselves. I still have 15 shots, so I'm not going to get close to these scary soldiers. I'll get one step closer, and then I will start throwing my shots at one of them. Ooh, we're doing very well here. Hitting every time, but he's getting closer now. We need to start hitting him again. There we go. Now he's running away. Oh, we missed. We want to get him before he gets away. We only have six shots, so I might pick up a couple before I start attacking again, and then I'll step back again safely away from him. We'll go nine squares away, and then we will start attacking him again. How do you target, and how do you throw, and how do you attack? To throw, you press the V key, Victor, and then you select it by pressing the B key. Bravo. And then to target, you hit the asterisk key. So, V, Victor, B, Bravo, asterisk, 
and now he's selected. To target him, you have to press the T key. If you want to select somebody else to target, you press the asterisk again, it'll cycle through all possible targets. So there's three of them. If the target is too far away and you hit target, it'll tell you that the target is out of range, and if you shoot at him, indicating that you might not reach him if you, sh if you try to throw this missile at him, which is true. If I throw the missile, it'll end up four squares too short, so we won't do that right now. Or maybe we will just to demonstrate. See, it came up short and landed here. So we'll do try again, and we'll target the soldier. And then by hitting the asterisk key, he's the first one that gets targeted, which is what we want. Then we press the T key to confirm that that's the target we want to hit. And then when you hit it, it throws the shot we had selected and it hits him. Now I can press all those combinations of keys again every time, or I can press the N key. The N key repeats the last action that happened. That's a lot faster. There are lots of little shortcuts in the game to make your quality of life in the dungeon a little bit better because you're going to spend a lot of time here if you like the game because there are so many dungeon levels and there's so many things to kill and to discover and you will see. So now as you saw, maybe you saw that the yellow, giant yellow centipede has woken up. Now he has a low attack of 4 average damage so he's not too too dangerous and he only has a life rating of seven so we're not going to worry about him right now we're going to focus on our soldier who is now wounded but he has a total average of 23 hit points we got a good hit and he is fleeing oh i think we missed i think he ran up the hallway now we can start shooting the centipede but we ran out of shots but that's okay he's running away so we'll let him run away and as he runs away we will go collect our shots I think I just saw the soldier up the corridor. We will collect our shots before we worry about him. Now, I want to... I think I'm going to start attacking him before he wakes up. Generally, it's not good to be attacking two monsters at the same time, but I think it'll be okay because the soldier's almost dead. Let's look at the Acolyte. He has a life rating of 18. He also gives us 4 points when we kill him. Armor rating of 15. We have an 81% chance of hitting him. And he has an attack of 1d5, averaging 3 damage on his turns. But he can also terrify or heal himself 1 in 12 times. So he's not as dangerous as the apprentice it would seem because the acolyte doesn't seem to be able to harm us. He can only heal himself and try to scare us and then try to kill us with his really weak attack. So he's sort of a pathetic opponent, but let's try to kill him. We hit him every time. That was great. Here's some gold pieces of copper that we were most happy to pick up. We do not need the food, but we'll hold on to it for now, I guess. Oh, we have one mana point. So now watch my experience. It says next. So that's how many points to reach level 4. I'm level 3 now. And this is my current points that I've gotten, 43 total since I've been playing. That's also my max. And the number I need to advance is 54, so hence 11. So I'll cast a spell and we'll see how many points I get. I succeeded, and now I only need five points. So I got like six points or something for doing that, casting that spell. And now we are going to, I think we will wait for the soldier to come back. Also, we now have 25 hit points from reaching level three, which is great. Seven more hit points than we have before. Here's the yellow centipede. He just took five health from us, wow. Well, we punched him, but that didn't do a lot of damage. So now we're gonna throw a shot at him. And he just took another 5 points. He's really getting us pretty good. We still have 15 hit points, so before we try to flee or phase door or something, we're going to try again to kill him. And we got him. He only gave us 1 point though. We're going to read this scroll after we kill the soldier. You never want to read scrolls in the middle of battles. Where did the soldier go? He really got frightened. Or maybe we did kill him. We can press control P and it'll show this list and then you can press equals and you can look for anything that happened that you're not sure what happened. You can look for the messages because it keeps a history up to 2000 lines of history. So we look for soldier. The last message we have is that he flees in terror and he writhes in agony. But there's nothing about him dying. So I think he's still somewhere up this corridor. We're gonna risk running up the corridor. There he is. He fled so far. He regenerated half his health. So we are going to, well, what I really want meant to say, he, fle he fled so far that he was too far away from us to find us again. So he didn't, he just stood up there. He would have just stayed up there. He would have never come back and if we hadn't sought him out. 
So we're going to try again to kill him. And that time we got him. And we gained another level. And our mana points jumped all the way to 4. So that's really good. Now it's 30 points to our next character level. And we now have 27 hit points. So we only gained 3 hit points, which is really bad. But I guess it's better than 1. The way your character gains hit points is whenever you level up, it rolls what's called a hit die. You roll a die, and the die is based on your race and your class. And hobbits have the worst hit die. They have 7 sides to their die versus a half troll, which has 12. And then you add ranger, which has another 5 or 6 points. So you end up with like the max you can get is about 12. Versus a half troll warrior, the max is 21. So we're going to end up with a lot less hit points than some other race class combos, but that's okay. What hobbits lack in hit points and strength, they make up with a slew of other really useful attributes such as stealth, excellent use of magical devices such as wands and staves, a remarkable ability to resist enemies' attempt to confuse, blind, and paralyze us, which is called their saving throw, deft fingers that are great at disabling traps and unlocking doors, and other skills besides that many stronger classes are much more terrible at. Now that we're on the stairs, we're going to read the scroll. If this scroll summons something scary, or if it's some bad scroll, we can just take the stairs and we'll be safe from whatever it is. It is a scroll of light. It basically lights a room. Such as this room, if we had read it in this room and this room had been dark, it would have lit the whole room. But now we know that scroll, we gain some character levels, we're safe to go down further. The door was broken open, I wonder if we should have looked in that door. We'll just keep going randomly. Now we get a message about the treasures on this level. You feel there may not be much interesting here. Now, th this message corresponds with this number down here. This 4 means the treasure feeling is 4. So basically is a range of 1 to 9. 1 means there's very poor treasures. Nothing of great value or rarity. And 9 means there's something extraordinarily rare and or expensive and or ver valuable and or out of depth. Meaning something you shouldn't be finding at this depth. So 4 is actually pretty good, especially in the early game. Anything you find in the early game that's a 3 or 4 or higher is really good, potentially, since we actually haven't really found anything yet. So we're going to explore this level and try to find that object, or objects. It's usually just one object on these early levels. It's only later when you find a vault where it could be more than one object creating a treasure feeling. Now this is a quartz vein with treasure in it. If I had a pick, I don't have any, I don't have a pick in my inventory. If I had a pick, I could drill into this and take gold or money from it. Or if we were playing dwarf, we would have an innate ability to dig into the granite. Obviously I used money at the store in town or the stores. Now this white jelly is an interesting monster or creature in, in the dungeon. He doesn't, he does not deign to chase intruders. This means he doesn't walk around the dungeon. He doesn't move. He stays stationary all the time. Which is good because you don't have to worry about him chasing after you. But it's bad because he's blocking the way and the only way to get around him is to kill him. But he has a lot of hit points so we may or may not have the means to kill him. I think we do because we have a lot of shots. We have 23. But if you're a melee only character you'd have to get up next to him and try to hit him. Now because he doesn't move he does other things like he moves quickly now moves here is an interesting word because he doesn't actually move but he takes actions and when this word means his actions and his movement so basically the speed at which you move is how quickly you do actions but it's also how quickly you move through the dungeon quickly means he moves twice as fast as us moving at normal speed so when he gets next to us he's going to poison us touch to poison 1d2 so 1d2 isn't a lot but he's doing it twice as often as everyone else that we've encountered so far because he's quick so an average one damage on each of his turn but he's going to get two turns every time his turn because he's quick so he'll do actually two damage on each of his turns to us and he'll also poison us which makes our hit points keep dropping so we do not want to get next to him that's scary now this dark purple text means that he is hurt by bright light meaning bright light does more damage than it does to other monsters that don't resist it same thing with cold if you hit him with some cold like an arrow that's branded with cold or a weapon that's branded with cold it will do more damage than normal. But he resists poison, acid, lightning, fire, nether, water, and other things. So this isn't so bad. Not bad at all. Easy to kill him. Oh, some new ones. 
So basically most things that are red that are people, like this is a shaman or a person or a mage or those that are casting spells, they will be red, meaning that they're a mage of some kind. And they're going to be causing magic that harms, such as magic missiles. And he has really high dice, 1d8. That's even more than the soldier. But fortunately, he does other things than just attack, so he's not going to be doing quite as much damage. But he only has 11 hit points, so he's not too bad. Though he does have 24 AC. And he's native to level 3. He gives us 11 and a quarter points for being killed, which is quite a lot. So we're happy to try to kill him. We're missing a lot. Probably because he does have more AC than some of the others. But he only did one damage, and now he's only got two stars left of his health, so we should be able to kill him, and we do. And we'll do the same with this guy. Ooh, so we got good hits that time, it only took two. More food, and our first weapon, it is a morning star. There are tons of different weapons in this game, I'm not going to read the descriptions of all of them. I'll read this one because it's our first one. A sturdy wooden pole connected by a chain to a ball of steel, which often has projecting spikes. The dice on here is 2d6, meaning two dice is two dice instead of just one, and six sides, so that's pretty good. It's also got some enchantments. It's considered a good morning star or magical because it has enchantments. So plus four means increases your chance of hitting, and plus five is how much damage it actually does. So plus five is quite a lot actually for an early weapon, and it does 12.9 damage. Now that's actually more than throwing our pebbles. We are a weak hobbit though. So we only get one blow per round, and we would need nine more strength before we can even get 1.1 blows per turn, I should say. That's actually a lot of damage. We will wield this heavy weapon, 15 pounds, quite heavy. That very well may be the four object, but we will keep exploring because there might be something else too. Now, I never showed you, but throwing these iron shots do five damage, so... This, uh, this new weapon's doing quite a lot more. That's really good. At some point we'll have to try it out on some creature, but a blubbery icky thing has 18 hit points, but only 4 armor, and it also poison, so we don't want to get up next to it. We're just going to try to kill it from afar. Carefully get closer. Now even though this is a dark room, we can see him beyond our torch, and that's because we have something called infravision which is the ability to see the warmth of a creature. It's very handy. It's another reason why we like the Hobbit, because it has 40 feet or four squares of native infravision. Each square is 10 feet, whereas, say, a human doesn't have any. So it's nice to have infravision. Anyway, let's kill this blubbery icky thing. Oh, we gained another level. That's great. Now we have 30 hit points, and we can study a new prayer, which is also great. Detect light. Now that's a really good spell. Press B to select and then question mark to read about it. Detects all living monsters in the immediate area for one turn only. So let's try it. We detect life. A green ooze. Another one of those jellies that doesn't move but can poison you or do other nasty things. And a metallic blue centipede. So we're going to look at these things and decide whether or not we want to pursue them. This one electrifies and can electrocute us doing just two damage per turn. So he doesn't seem too dangerous. But he does move quickly, so that's something to be concerned about, which is mitigated slightly by the fact that he moves somewhat erratically. Also doesn't seem to have a lot of hit points of armor, which is good. And the green ooze shoots acid. It only does two damage, but acid is a corrosive thing, and you don't really want to get hit by it. It's going to damage our inventory, and it can actually destroy scrolls and harm our armor. Although it can't harm our weapon as long as we are wielding it, so that is good. We don't have our scroll of light, so we can't light this room though. But we can find all our shots. And here he is. This should be pretty easy to kill. Oh, he didn't die. Instead of throwing more shots at him, we can try to hit him with our weapon. And we got him. And we killed him. We'll keep exploring. Hopefully we don't run into it. So fortunately, our infravision alerts us before we run into it. He has a life rating of 8. Actually, this one does move. It's not stationary. So it does deign to chase after intruders. And he's quick too, but he moves extremely radically, so he probably won't be lying to us. Let's see. Oop. He stood our ground instead of running away, and that paid off, and we got him before he could shoot acid at us. 
We could go back upstairs, but why would we want to do that? We can dig into rubble. This is a pile of rubble, and we can dig by pressing capital T in the direction we want to dig. Sometimes there's treasures under rubble. Here's another kobold. This one is a small kobold. He seems pretty easy to kill. He only has eight hit points. I'm just gonna melee these ones. Look at that. He hit us first because we stepped forward next to him and then it was his turn and he didn't have to step towards us. He's, he could just start hitting us. So you have to be careful when you're walking up to enemies. But we got him pretty good with our morning star and we're gonna finish him off with our shots. Ooh. Now this is interesting. It's a hard leather cap. You can wear it on your head. It has a base of two, but has an extra five AC as a bonus. And that means that it's quite good. It also has question marks, so it's gonna have some special ability as well. You have learned the root of infravision. Your eyes tingle. You are wearing a hard leather cap of infravision, plus three. So basically what this means is now our infravision is 70 feet. We can see even farther into the dark. This is really good. This is probably what caused us to have the four treasure filling. So we learned the rune. So there's this game is basically the way these roguelikes work is that you're in a dungeon, you don't know anything. So if you had downloaded this game and you were playing along with me, you'd see that you would not know anything about any of these creatures because you haven't played the game yet. As you play the game and die, you remember what your ancestors experienced and you know about the monsters as they do stuff to you. So I play this game a lot, so I know a lot about each of the monsters. But anyway, there's a character sheet. When you get to the character sheet, you press capital C and then the left arrow key. This sheet shows you all the different runes there are in the game. We've only learned two. We've learned Infravision and Hold Life. We actually haven't learned Hold Life, but we have it natively. That is, we knew it at the start of the game. So we don't know any of these other runes. And as we learn runes, there's equipment in the game that will have something related to one of these runes. It'll either provide resistance to a nexus, which is an elemental attack, or it will offer regeneration, which makes your hit points go quicker. So there's all these sorts of runes that different equipment can provide for the character to make it more powerful. Well, I think that's gonna do us for our first session, but we're just getting started. There's lots more to come. Exciting. Very dangerous though. Eight danger level. 